Hi, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm with the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology and also I'm with the Carleton University Department of Geography and Environmental Studies. In this video I'd like to talk about some of the very large feedbacks that are inherent in the climate system. Many, many people uh, talk about the so-called positive or reinforcing feedbacks which are, are analogous to having a ball on top of a hill. You push the ball a little bit, it starts rolling down the hill and it, then it accelerates as it gets to steeper and steeper parts of the hill. The opposite uh, to these positive, they're not positive in a good way, they're positive in that you make a small change and they result, these feedbacks result in a larger system change in the same direction as the initial small change. So they cause an amplification of the response of the system to the, to the uh, force or the thing that's causing it to change. So negative feedbacks are breaking feedbacks or slowing feedbacks. Think, so in the analogy to negative feedbacks, think of a ball in the bottom in the valley. Um, not on top of a hill but in the valley. So you push the ball a little bit to the left or to the right or front or back and it goes up the hill slightly gravity pulls it back down to where it started. So it's a stabilizing feedback in a system. So many people when they talk about um, uh, abrupt climate change and rapid changes in the system focus on the accelerating feedbacks, the positive feedbacks such as you know we lose snow and ice in the Arctic, the Arctic gets darker, absorbs more sunlight, we melt more snow and ice and then the process spirals upwards. Now, there are lots of positive feedbacks in the system, but there are also significant negative feedbacks. So this video, I'm talking about some of the negative feedbacks that tend to stabilize a system. So I'll talk first about some of the physical ones, and then I'll talk about some of the human ones. So one of the, I did a num number of videos, um, you know, a week or so ago, about uh, the idea that yes, people are getting, you know, they're getting um, basically emphasizing the negative things and ignoring the positive things. Or, you know, if we talk about the feedbacks, that's the opposite. They're emphasizing the positive feedbacks and not the negative feedback. So I was very surprised that since um, those videos and people have been saying, well, what are the biggest negative feedbacks? And I said, okay, I'm going to do talk about it in the future, but I was surprised that nobody looked it up and determined, you know, then came back and told me about the Stefan Boltzmann equation. Okay, so here's, well, here's the scoop. So a body like the sun uh, emits a lot of energy because it's at uh, 6,000 degrees Kelvin. The earth emits energy because it's at, because the surface of the earth is at 288 Kelvin. To convert to Kelvin, take degrees Celsius and uh, add um, 273 deg degrees. So basically, zero degrees Kelvin is absolute zero. All motion stops, vibration stops. We can't physically attain zero Kelvin. It's minus 273.15 or something like that Celsius. So zero Celsius is 273 Kelvin, roughly. 15 Celsius, which we'll say is the average temperature on the surface of the Earth, is 15 plus 273 or 288 Kelvin. So keep those numbers in mind. If the Earth's atmosphere didn't exist, the average temperature on the surface of the Earth would be minus 19 degrees Celsius, or and it is now, because we have an atmosphere, 15 degrees Celsius. That's the difference of 19 plus 15 is 34 degrees Celsius difference because of our atmosphere. Okay, so let's calculate. So how do we calculate what the equilibrium temperature of the Earth is? Well, it's very straightforward. We take the temperature of the sun, 6,000 Kelvin. That the temperature alone determines, if you assume a perfect black body, which the sun is, I won't talk about that detail, then their Stefan Boltzmann law says that the radiation, the watts per square meter on the surface coming from the sun's surface at 6,000 Kelvin would be sigma epsilon times temperature to the fourth power. So the parameter, the variable is temperature to the fourth power. Okay, sigma is the Stefan Boltzmann constant, epsilon 
is the emissivity assumed to be one for perfect black bodies and is pretty damn good for the sun. Okay, so, so temperature of the fourth is the key parameter, so the sun radiates loads of energy. Now this energy spreads out through space. Okay, it goes in all directions equally. So think of a surface of a sphere. Now the surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. The volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed, where r is the radius of the sphere. So the energy spreads out uh, as this sphere moves out from the sun carrying energy. That's how the intensity decreases. So the intensity decreases um, you need to divide the intensity that you calculate from the Stefan Boltzmann law, divide it by the uh, surface area to get it watts per square meter um, as, the, as the, the energy moves out from the sun. So it decreases as a, with an R squared law. So then it reaches the earth and we can calculate the energy at the top of the atmosphere. It's something like 1360, uh, around there, 1360, what's the number? 1360, eight or something like that watts per square meter at the surf at outside the atmosphere that's called the solar constant that number just depends on how far you are from the sun so you know a, a planet like mercury remember how the order is from the sun mother very early makes jam sandwiches using no peanuts uh, but peanuts doesn't exist anymore because pluto it may exist again soon but m is mercury venus earth mars etc using that uh, saying. Okay, so Mercury, Venus, um, Earth, Mercury and Venus have larger solar constants. Mars is less because it's further from the sun. Okay, so that's the first thing. That's how much energy is coming in. How much energy is going out? Well, the Earth will have an equilibrium temperature and you use the Stefan Boltzmann law to equate that, um, the energy in watts per square meter coming out of the sun to what's going in so what's, sorry, what's coming out of the Earth has to equal what's going into the Earth to have an equilibrium temperature. Otherwise, if more is going in, then the temperature of the Earth has to rise in order to emit more by that Stefan Boltzmann law, sigma epsilon temperature to the fourth power. So the temperature will rise up until more energy is going out to balance, the energy going out is increased to balance the energy coming in. So this is how we calculate the equilibrium. So if you throw in those numbers um, for the Earth and equate what's going into what's going out, you can calculate the temperature equilibrium of the Earth and you get a value that's about, I think it's uh, 273 minus 19. So you get a value of about 254 Kelvin for that number. And you say, okay, well, how does it calculate that number? Well, that equation, that simple way of calculating doesn't account for the atmosphere. So the atmosphere, so the number you calculate for equilibrium temperature is that minus 19, which is just the Earth without an atmosphere, and then you calculate with the Earth's atmosphere, it gets you up to that 15 degrees Celsius, which is a 34 degree difference from no atmosphere to atmosphere. So where am I getting at with all this? As the Earth increases in temperature, then there's a temperature to the fourth power dependent. So that will lead to as you increase energy coming in then the temperature of the earth will rise the emission levels will rise according to the Stefan Boltzmann law and that will reach an equilibrium temperature for that new amount of energy coming in or the new amount of energy that's being trapped because of the additional greenhouse gases so this is a you know this is a fundamental basic feedback system negative feedback system which limits the upper temperature of the earth because of this radiation from the earth. Now I didn't do this video earlier, I wanted to leave it a little bit and see if anybody was actually going to come up and tell me. The supposed scientists, in quotes, non-scientists, who are talking about all of these feedback effects, obviously, you know, maybe they study biology too much, maybe they study other subjects. They're not engineers, they're not physicists, they're not climatologists, you know, they don't know um, something like the Stefan Boltzmann um, radiation law um, as being a large negative feedback, then this is a problem. Okay, so I can talk about other physical feedback effects, but I, do, I will do that in subsequent videos because 
I want to now look at the human feedback effect. Just the basic logic of human feedback. Okay? Humans react when they're threatened. Okay? We have this primitive amygdala brain, the fight and flight response. There's not enough people that feel that are threatened enough. So, when we, our backs are to the wall, when we feel our very existence is being threatened, then we will act. We will throw all the resources that we have at the problem. And this is when we will take military budgets, which Trump is just talking about increasing in the U.S., which is absolutely insane since, uh, you know, the U.S. military budget will be 600 billion and the nearest country is, 10, is uh, 100 billion. So the U.S. spends more than the next 10 countries or 20 countries combined in military budget. You know, I mean, they're scared, they're scared of shadows, basically. They ignore climate change and they're scared of, of uh, you know, of terrorism and, you know, Homeland Security is developed. I mean, forget it, man. Your country's being trashed by climate change. The sooner you accept that, the more you will realize climate change is a big problem. But anyway, that's, I'm, I'm trying to uh, stay on, on uh, what we know, on the physical nature. So, obviously, if a catastrophe strikes humanity and civilization was to be severely reduced or buckled, emissions will plummet to very, very small levels. We know this is going to happen when there's a recession. The 2008 recession really clipped off the amount of fossil fuels that humanity burned. Oil demand went way down, coal demand went way down, everything else went way down. Industrial output really dropped off a cliff and as a result emissions dropped right down. So this is like one of the bar stools, slashing emissions. If we go into major civilization disruption, collapse, call it what you want, emissions are going to plummet. Um, okay, that's one aspect. Another aspect is carbon dioxide removal. Okay, if, if, if emission, if civilization goes downhill, population starts dropping instead of increasing at 1.4% per year, which is 240,000 people per day, will level it. It'll level first, but likely it'll, it, when it reaches the zero point, it'll be plummeting downwards. So if it plummets downward, what, from global starvation, from failed crops, simultaneous, whatever, whatever does it, then human population will plummet and this will, you know, we all breathe out CO2, we all burn CO2, we're all big emitters, so if the population drops, you know, a few billion people, then emit, there'll be a few billion less people breathing and consuming and buying things, so, you know, this will be a big effect at lowering CO2 levels that are being produced, so this will allow plants Meanwhile, you know, as there's less and less people, there's more and more vegetation starts growing in, the, in different areas, and that sucks CO2 out of the atmosphere. You know, the oceans start, uh, you know, re, re, there's less fishing, there's less mouths to feed, the oceans start regaining uh, biomass and sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere. So this is carbon dioxide removal, very large feedback. Um, solar radiation management, okay, I'll do a whole separate video on Global dimming, I've seen numbers from half a degree Celsius to, um, to uh, four degrees Celsius. I have to look at the latest papers. You know, my gut feeling is that there's no way it's four. You know, it'll be closer to a half or one. And industry, I would argue, is not going to, it's not going to vanish overnight globally. It's going to be phasing out in different places. Um, and, uh, you know, as a result, it will have a temperature rise. But we can, uh, we can easily calculate the global dimming effect and we can just put uh, sulfur up into the stratosphere if it's an emergency basis to easily offset global dimming and, in fact, far exceed the cooling from global dimming, create this large, I call it, anthropogenic volcano, whether it be in the Arctic or, you know, elsewhere, and we can, we can dim the sun, you know, we just need to cut it back a few a percent or a couple percent, you know, and we can get large cooling. So this is a very large negative feedback. The other thing is that, you know, humanity will be rowing together as a team if we collectively feel threatened. And we're, we're reaching this tipping point in human understanding of the climate problem. I, I said as far as 10 years ago that it would require the loss of sea ice in order perhaps to change humans' behavior. So we're getting very close to that point within a year or two. Please support my work and videos at paulbeckwith.net. 
Google my name and Paul Beckwith to look at my many YouTube videos. Thank you for uh, your